what are the common arguments you hear against and how do you respond to each argument? The, the most common argument, um, I guess there are, two, there are two very common arguments. One is that by going through some sort of web-based publication, I will no longer be allowed to publish in a formal journal publication. Um, that is, for the most part, just untrue now. Um, there are holdout journals, um, but to be honest, they're mostly lower quality journals. Um, and medical journals, but that's that's, that's, there's a special case there. Um, so that, that argument is, I think, disappearing because it's becoming irrelevant. The notion that some, something cannot be public until it appears, it appears in a journal is, is, frankly, slightly bizarre in this day and age. The, the other main argument is the concern of people taking data, stealing it, um, and then doing more work with it. Um, and I've kind of got two arguments against that. Well, one is, I know very few examples where that's actually happened, and I know lots of examples where people have taken data, done interesting things with it, and given credit and involved people um, in the process. So I think it's, there's again, there's, we worry about the risks, a set of risks that we understand. We don't think about the risks of not making stuff available of the papers or the collaborations that don't happen. Um, that's 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 the, the, the positive argument. The other is that there's a slightly strange thing of saying, oh, but, but if I publish it, then someone will be able to steal it, that you've published it. It's date stamped, it's sitting on a website, it's going to be picked up by the archive, it's going to be date stamped by Google. Um, you know, you, you've got a very strong claim that this was online available and that they have used it. Um, so theft seems to become a slightly odd thing. Now, then there's the issue of, well, that's not really published, it's not properly published, it's not in the journal. And that's a cultural problem that I think we need to deal with, that there isn't the um, respect and reward given for publishing data or methods that there is for publishing a paper. Um, and that's something that's going to take quite a long time to change. Um, there are people looking at generating sort of data publication systems and where people are worrying about how to cite data and things like that. But it still remains the case that people are not going to get as much credit for the data as they will for a paper for a while. So what's important, I think, is to emphasize again that what generally happens, and the experience for this is pretty consistent, that if people take data that's not in a big database, if people take data that's in a big database, they'll take it, they'll use it, and they'll cite it. That's, that, that works most of the time. Um, when it's sort of on a local website or it's something bespoke or something like that, in every case I'm aware of, anyone who's actually gone and taken that data um, and reused it has asked the authors whether they would like to be included in the project and whether they would like to be authors on the paper. There's a wonderful example of this from Steve Cook's lab at University of New Mexico, where some of the students, um, they're doing um, uh, kinase and motility assays, um, but they, they basically, their, their, their basic data is a video of what looks like worms running across the screen. Um, and so they take these videos and they've been sticking them on YouTube. Why not? Um, it's interesting, and they thought it, they also felt that it was a good place to put video. And the, so the, a bunch of physicists came across these videos and um, used them to validate a theoretical model. And they asked whether the student wanted to be included on the paper. And the student, I th and I think to his credit, said, "Well, not really, because I haven't contributed to your work and I don't understand it." But the mere fact that the data was provided that this other group felt that they should at least ask the question, I think is, is indicative of the fact that there's a strong culture of assigning credit. And the kind of people who don't assign credit and do steal data are the kind of people who are going to steal it off a poster or by you know, trying to grab it while they're in the lab and take photos of things on people's desks. They're not the kind of people you want to be working with anyway. The third big issue, um, and this is an underlying one that people don't admit, is the concern about being embarrassed. It's the, I'm going to look like an idiot. And that's a really big issue because, A, in my experience, most researchers have a pretty severe inferiority complex. 
um, always worried about comparing themselves to each other. And it's a very... The people who succeed are the ones who are seen as to have never made a misstep. So you know, you're only allowed to admit that you've ever made a mistake once you get your Nobel Prize, basically. Um, and so the notion that you'd expose your working um, is a real concern to a lot of people. Um, they won't admit it in most cases, but that, that's really one of the main underlying reasons. And again, I think there's a positive counter to that, which is that it does help you, encourage you to maintain higher standards of reporting. Um, and I guess there's another, there's another kind of related thing to that, which is, is important, and that's the question of data. What is the status of data as it's just come off the instrument, or you've just recorded it, or you know it, it might not yet be processed, or it might be wrong. I mean, it might actually be the result of an artifact or a problem, and you could be misleading people by making this stuff available, um, and that could have really serious consequences, um, particularly if these things are clinical trials. So. I think there are, there are two answers to that. One is the, there has been an experience of going through these processes in Big Pharma where they've opened up lab notebook systems to the whole company. And where they've done that, um, they've had these problems. Um, and the, the, the thing has always been to make it very clear when the researcher has signed off on a record and said, I think this is OK now. And up until that point, you can use it, but at your own risk. I think that, that's a really important kind of principle that you know, no one can guarantee well, no one can guarantee that things are right anyway. But but you, until someone said, "Yeah, I'm happy with this. It's kind of finished," then you can't even, in any sense, rely on them. Um, rely on that on that information that they're providing. Um, I think the other the other side of it is that they're clearly you do move into areas where um, release of data is dangerous. Um, in clinical research, in animal research. Um, and there are other areas where you c releasing the data can affect the results of the study. So it's true in a lot of social science cases. Um, and I think the, the question there is to really understand what those issues are. Um, and we shouldn't use those cases as an excuse not to make things available. Um, they are reasons to not make things available. But if we reset the default to available, and then there's a reason for not making things available, then that's a much more productive way. Because then we can actually have a discussion about why and how these things shouldn't be made available, or what, or should be made available, what time frames, and all of these things um, that will actually help the data collection, help the process of thinking carefully around the data. So it's, um, I think it's it's largely about resetting the default, and once you have the right cultural infrastructure around that as a default, then a lot of other things become a lot easier. Um, but those, I mean, they're real concerns. And we don't do anyone any good by pretending they don't exist. So addressing them is a really important part of the process. What's been interesting and to a certain extent embarrassing is the extent to which the government agenda on open data has gone way ahead of what the scientific community has been prepared to take on. Um, now, and various aspe aspects of that haven't been well handled in, in a number of different ways, but you know, the, 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 the sense that you know, this is going to happen, this is being pushed through, um, and there's a real will to make it happen, actually, from, from the very top, um, is something that I, I find quite embarrassing isn't a strong thing in, in the research community. Um, so so that's, that's an interesting aspect. And I think there's, the, there's also, as a society, we're still grappling with the issue of what transparency means and what practical, what are the appropriate boundaries on transparency to create spaces where people can be comfortable working um, and can be protected from distraction. And it's not just science. It's no, no, absolutely. It's quite well. I mean, yeah. the WikiLeaks is just the touch paper for this, but it's um, in a world where pretty much all data can be made available, and it's the easiest way to make it available to yourself. Um, and in a world where 
services are running off the basis they're siphoning this data through a system so they can use it and then just feed it back to us. I think we've got, we have a lot of issues to work through that are much bigger than just the research community um, that relate to this. But I don't think, there's certainly a sense in which um, the cultural expect, the social, society's expectations of um, the transparency of information have jumped a long way. And I still find it, I think the, the, the um, uh, East Anglia climate email um, hacking, I think is the, probably this, one of the strongest indications of that. I mean, there are all these conversations about whether they, you know, did, did someone play with the peer review process? Did someone, were, were they nasty? I mean, so you get all this blown up in the media and, and, and that's what gets the headlines. And, you know, we've had all the inquiries and basically, you know, actually that is just, that's what happens in the research community. What's happening in any community where people don't like each other. Um, you talk to people on a train, on a bus about this, and what they were deeply shocked about was that the data was not available. That's the thing that they find incomprehensible. When you see um, scandals erupting around um, clinical tests of drugs where the data has been buried, that's what shocks people. And the, the simple fact is that the public assumption now is that data that is relevant to the public is public. And when it's not, they're not impressed. And if the research community doesn't grapple with that and doesn't deal with the, that fact that we need to be delivering on that, um, we're going to be in serious trouble. 